Okay, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right, three, two, one. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In this episode, I speak with Jeffrey Baird, managing partner at Merit Point Partners. Merit Point Partners seeks to build diversified portfolios of convexity exposure through the commodities market. With that in mind, we talk about what makes the commodities market unique, who the players are, and the types of trades that Jeff looks for. Stepping somewhat outside of the theme for this podcast, Jeff actually employs a heavily fundamentals-driven process. But what fundamental means in the commodity space is different than what it traditionally means in the equity space. So Jeff walks us through how this concept applies in markets such as gold and natural gas. With so many markets and corresponding derivatives to trade, the opportunity set seems overwhelming. And so does the risk of managing a portfolio. Jeff talks us through his framework for managing risk and the seemingly backwards idea that being profitable in a position can actually introduce more risk for portfolios that are seeking convexity. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Jeff Baer. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you here. Thanks, Corey. I want to start with your background. How did you come to get into trading the commodity space and implementing option-based convexity strategies? Well, I got into the commodity space in kind of an offhanded way. I grew up in Chicago and I'm fairly tall. I played basketball when I was younger and in my high school days, I used to play at a local gym. There were a number of guys who played there who worked on the floor of the CBOT and the CME. And one afternoon early before the summer started, one of the guys asked me, hey, what are you doing for the summer? And you know, this was high school. I'm washing cars and mowing lawns and like roughing soccer games. That's about as extent of my summertime activities. And he said, hey, how'd you like to come and work for me on the floor? And I said, all right, I don't know what to do. He's like, don't worry, you don't have to do anything. You just need to be tall and stand next to me so that people can see me. So that didn't sound too hard. So I signed up and, you know, one thing led to another. But that, that was my first experience. I spent a bunch of summers kind of in the rough and tumble old trading pits in Chicago and got really enthralled with it. Tried to develop some of my own trading strategies during college. Uh, a lot of it kind of computerized, more quant driven. I mean, this is this is in the, the late 1990s. So, uh, or sorry, early to mid 1990s. I was fascinated with markets. And so even in college, when I studied mechanical engineering, as interesting a coursework as that was, I kind of knew by the end of it that trading was much more interesting and ended up gravitating that way. And before we get into the nitty gritty details of your strategy and dive in, can we maybe take a step back and give us a high level overview, maybe sort of the high level objective of what you're trying to achieve, sort of the outcome you're trying to hit, what sort of markets you trade and what instruments you trade? Yeah, definitely. Highest level objective for me is I'm really trying to, striving to deliver consistent, uncorrelated returns. That's cut it down to one sentence. I'm really implementing that through trying to build diversified portfolios of convexity exposure, utilizing kind of all the available commodity markets that I have at my disposal. You know, risk-taking for me is primarily done utilizing options, everything from plain vanilla calls and puts all the way to calendar spread options or crack or differential or basis options, and then into more exotic structures, variance swaps, barriers, digitals, that kind of stuff as well. When markets allow for that and when I can find those kinds of things. Why the commodities space? Well, it's the space certainly that I understand the best. That's where my background is, and that's why I've ended up here. But I think 
for the strategy that I'm really trying to pursue, and to me, what makes commodities super interesting for an investor should be the ability to generate uncorrelated returns. You have a couple of dozen, if not more, different market structures, different groups of markets that are all not only uncorrelated with themselves, but uncorrelated a lot of the times with major asset classes, so equities and bonds and credit. You know, it's a lot easier as a manager for me to try to deliver uncorrelated returns, I think, operating in an underlying landscape like that versus, you know, a long short equity manager. It's just hard. That's very difficult to try to deliver an uncorrelated return stream when your underlying assets that you're trading are all correlated. That's what offers it to me. I think the other, the other big separator um, for commodities from other asset classes, I think, is around this notion that commodities are kind of instantaneously cash settled. They have a forcing function that mandates that prices converge to levels that the current market here and now is producing and consuming those assets at. So equities, I always think of equities more as a, as a perpetual security. There's really no maturity date when you own an equity tranche in something. And as such, you're kind of relying on the market to come around to your point of view, if you will, or to identify the fundamentals that you as a manager might have identified. On the commodity space, there's usually a finite time horizon here. Are we trading securities with an expiration date at which time they're going to be consumed by somebody somewhere, or they're going to be stored or whatever there is going to happen to them. And I think that it allows for a type of fundamental analysis that can play out over a very known time horizon. So if you're trading something with a six month maturity, you don't have to guess is the market going to figure this out or six months or not. You're either going to be right or you're going to be wrong. You know, and then sort of pairing that with the derivatives market gives you a really robust landscape of opportunities to try to not only diversify across the different markets, but you can diversify through time, you can diversify through some of these other instruments. But, and I think that that is a fairly unique feature of the commodity space. When you're looking at the landscape, who are the other players in this market that are trading these instruments alongside you? Yeah, so that's changed a lot over the years and I expect it will continue to kind of ebb and flow. When I first started in the industry, it was, as I said, the kind of mid nineties, Financial commodity markets just in general were smaller. From the speculative side, commercial and investment banks, a few of them had desks, but it wasn't a big presence. It was usually kind of a backwater, you know, it was often the corner of the trading floor. Uh, you couldn't figure out, does it go with FX? Does it go with EM? Do we put it in the rates group? We're not really sure where to put these guys. There were funds who were certainly active in the market, but they tended to be smaller in those days. And they were usually either CTAs in those days, a big CTA was a $500 million fund, or they tended to be more macro-oriented, purely discretionary kind of macro players. Physical trading shops were active at that time, and they, again, have kind of ebbed and flowed over the years. I think as you got into the late 90s, you saw the rise of the energy merchants, so Enron being kind of the largest of those. They began to play a much more prominent role in energy markets, particularly gas and power. You saw during that same time, kind of late 90s and into the early 2000s, commercial and investment banks start to really get into the space in a larger way. You saw them make investments in people in terms of balance sheets. And even when you saw kind of the, the rollover collapse of the energy merchant space, a lot of investment banks stepped in and hired those teams and brought them on board. So by the time of the financial crisis, you really had kind of very big investment bank presence is in the space. They had a lot of really, from my perspective as a derivatives trader as well, a lot of people who were very options, not only literate, but capable. They had deep balance sheets, very active desks, big risk taking, those kind of things. And, and they really did kind of dominate the market. I think post the financial crisis, we've kind of seen a gradual unwinding of that, certainly from the banking side as a combination of regulatory and just general I suppose commercial considerations have kind of taken over for them. So you know, I think today they take a small fraction of the risk and, and kind of warehouse a small fraction of the, the types of risk that they did 10 or 15 years ago. We've also seen, I think, a gradual disappearance from risk taking from the fund side. So the kind of two big dominant entities that were there pre the financial crisis have really over the last 10 years 
they're still there, but they're just nowhere near the size that they used to be. You have seen the rise, I think, of some physical oriented trading shops again, maybe in the last seven or eight years. Some of them have been a little credit constrained lately, but those guys have come back to the fore a little bit. And then I think the most, maybe the newest development over the last five to seven years is the rise of factor risk model investing out of hedge fund in a box replication strategies, algorithmic strategies, all those things. I think that the momentum based algorithmic strategies have always been there through the CTA world, but the rise of the amount of risk taking that you see from those strategies and then coupled with carry strategies and congestion strategies and volatility strategies and things that comprise your risk factor models. Those types of strategies are are very prevalent today in the market and definitely do do a lot of the day-to-day price moving, I think. On the commercial side, your biggest participants are kind of the obvious ones. You've got end users and you've got producers. You've seen those cycle really specifically by commodities over time. So as an example, you know, when I started in the mid-90s, you had gold producers were very, very active hedgers using very sophisticated derivative instruments. Some of them actually so sophisticated that we couldn't price them. <laughs> we did not price them. In the central bank gold accords in 1999, you saw a very violent move in gold and the ramifications of that through that producing community were basically that they kind of swore off hedging. A lot of them got burned, a couple of them went bankrupt, and all of them basically pledged that they were never ever going to hedge ever again. So, and then recently, fast forward 20 years, you have seen some of them back in the market now layering hedges very specific to certain projects or certain currency hedges where there might be operating mines and things like that. So there's there's kind of an ebb and flow to when these folks are in the market. You operate in a pretty broad market, so I'm a little hesitant that this question might be too big a scope, but are there certain markets that are better or worse for your approach? So for example, and this might be either structural or, or cyclical, for example, like the presence of non-economic actors maybe in one market or another, or one market maybe have more of a looming threat from geopolitical risk that might make convexity expensive. Do you see that there are just some of these commodity markets tend to be a better focus for you? A prerequisite, I guess, for my strategy, because I'm so options oriented is, you know, I need there to be a deep enough and liquid enough derivatives market for me to be able to um, to trade, essentially. The energy complex has always been kind of the most robust uh, in terms of having a matrix of different option markets, you know, not only vanilla markets and different instruments or an underlying markets such as crude oil and gasoline and, and heating oil, but then you have kind of the entire matrix of options on some of those spreads and relationships and you have crack options, which is your products versus crude. You've got calendar spread options between different delivery months. In natural gas, you have basis options between different gas delivery points and Henry Hub and so each of these things kind of provide their own unique set of opportunities. You know, in my portfolio, I think over the long term, I'd probably say that 60 to 70% of what I do is going to be in the energy space, you know, at some point in time. Metals is kind of the other largest class of markets that have really robust derivative markets. I think gold has probably the most sophisticated derivative markets in the commodity space. It trades very much like a foreign exchange product. So there's everything from variant swaps to digitals to binaries and barriers, whatever you want to trade in gold, probably somebody somewhere is willing to price it. You know, as you move away kind of into base metals, you move away from some of the more exotic side of that derivative, but you still have very deep, very liquid option markets. One of the other defining factors for me is kind of how far out the curve can you trade? How far out is there liquidity and opportunity? And again, energy space, you can trade things out four or five years pretty easily. Gold, you can trade out 10 years if you want to. As you get into some smaller markets like grains, they'll have deep option markets, but they're probably only out till the next season, you know, the next crop cycle. So it's a little more limiting. You just have to be cognizant of what you're trading in which market. You kind of then touched on, I suppose, touching on those are the markets that kind of provide me enough of a landscape to trade in from a derivatives point of view. I think then there's also the, where can you find interesting opportunities from market participants that might be looking at options through a different framework than I am. So for example, in the energy space, kind of coming back to that, 
there's storage operators who own storage assets and they will look at calendar spread options as a way for them to generate a yield on those assets. They can sell options either on their capacity if, if it's not full or maybe on the oil that's in the tank, you know, if they're full. And it's not that they're uneconomic, they're just looking at it from a different lens. They may or may not care about what the volatility associated with that is or what sort of implied correlation is embedded in that option between the different delivery months. They're really looking at that saying, hey, I've got an asset sitting here and I can earn 4% on this asset next month by selling this option. I don't really have anything else to do with it right now, so this is what I'm gonna do. And I think when you have different actors in the markets doing things for different reasons, that always can lead to opportunities. Those things are always interesting. You touched a little bit on like geopolitical risk. I mean, some of those geopolitics are kind of maybe recently macro trade war, some of these different types of macro events. It certainly can make cheap convexity harder to find to the extent that the market is pricing in that type of uncertainty through generally higher implied volatilities. They definitely manifest differently in different markets. I've noticed, for example, with the trade war rhetoric, when we really heated up a year and a half ago on that, the markets that you would expect to see that manifest in, you saw higher vol levels, soybeans and cotton, and you know, some of the very direct markets that are being discussed and talked about in these things. Over time, that kind of faded. Implied volatilities fell back a little bit. I think there was a little bit of fatigue in the marketplace in terms of just headline and I think, frankly, some of those markets didn't manifest the type of movements that people had expected, perhaps ultimately that the kind of banter back and forth just got priced in. And it felt like the market collectively almost said, well, hey, just call us when you guys know how this is going to end. We're really interested, <laughs> but like we really can't watch you know, every move here. So it just it's different. Obviously, oil, we've seen a lot of geopolitics, particularly in the latter uh, half of last year and early part of, of this year um, with the attacks in Saudi Arabia and the retaliatory attacks from the United States. That definitely, I saw that make it much harder to express some of my fundamental views on the oil market because you did see implied volatilities trade up pretty significantly. You saw curve moves and things kind of pricing in this uncertainty. It did, it made it harder to find opportunities to express highly leveraged kind of cheap convexity type of bets. So yes, it can definitely have an impact. Given the breadth of the markets you've already discussed and I, the breadth of the instruments as well, I'm a little hesitant to ask my next question, but I, I want to ask only because I want to try to make this a little bit more concrete, at least for myself. So I will ask it, is there a prototypical trade or something that sort of represents the type of prototypical trade that you would be looking for when you are trying to express this convexity in your portfolio? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think my short answer is no. Maybe my, my little bit. <laughs> I think it's a really reasonable question. I do think there's certain styles of trading where you can kind of come back to certain trades when they present themselves from time to time. I think, you know, it's not that I'll never do the same trade twice. Certainly we do see opportunities that'll kind of repeat sometimes, but there's not really one particular trade type that I've found I can come back to over and over again over the years. I think I'm just generally always searching for those opportunities to find really cheap convexity or really high leverage. And the simplest implementation of that sometimes is just when implied vols get really cheap. If an implied vol in a particular market is historically exceptionally cheap, and we can look at that market and say, look, there's no reason why something can't happen in this market over the next six months or a year or however far forward we think we can access that convexity. We'll look for reasons to try to do that trade. It's kind of like, tell me, we put the onus on ourselves essentially to try to find a reason not to do it if we see really cheap ball. And if we can't find a reason not to do it, then we'll just do it rather than saying, I've got some strong fundamental view one way or the other here. It's more like, look, if I can buy really cheap ball, I probably want to do that more times than not. The thing that tends to make the most interesting opportunities and the ones that tend to, I think, get sized the largest in our portfolio is when you have a confluence of different factors that all kind of come together in a certain way. So even setting aside the fundamental analysis of the market for a second, just the various components that go into a given option price, you have not only an implied ball, but you'll have a skew or an entire kind of ball surface to look at but you have the term structure of the underlying commodity itself, you know, the price level of that commodity. Commodities, one of the other things that makes them attractive is they all have different term structures, they all have different forward curves, 
those forward curves themselves tend to have volatility. So the shape of the curve can change a lot through time for a lot of the markets. And sometimes conditions that are rational or reasonable in one of those factors or individually in multiple factors. So let's say we have a vault curve that looks pretty rational and a forward curve that looks rational and price. When you add them all up, sometimes they can give you pretty interesting derivative pricing. So an example of that maybe is, you know, in natural gas about a year and a half ago, we had a situation where the natural gas curve was fairly backwardated. We had a vol surface and a curve that was fairly backwardated, that being nearby prices much more expensive than farther forward prices. And all those things kind of made sense. The term structure of volatility in gas is typically backwardated. You have more volatility in your pump contracts. The forward curve can kind of be either way. We've seen upward sloping or downward sloping. But when you looked at skews and how aggressive they were in the short end and not the long end, and then looked at where some strikes were priced, you could essentially own two-year maturity options that would, in theory, decay positively over a 12-month period. So the market was basically saying, if the market's static and we just roll forward through time over the next year, these options that you're buying in, with the maturity date in Cal 20, let's call it, or Cal 21, I guess, at that time, by the time they become calendar year 20 options, we expect them to be more expensive, not less expensive than the ones that you're buying today. So that's a situation where you just have a series of factors that are working together to sometimes create these things that like, hey, I can rent this option for a year. I don't really know what's gonna happen, but I really have a very limited expectation of loss just sitting here holding this thing. And in commodities, something may happen. I want to emphasize that because I think if I'm following you correctly, that is a very different aspect of the commodity market than the equity market, which is if I'm following you again, you can actually have positive carry and have long convexity at the same time or positive expected carry from the roll down of the futures curve. I'd like to look for those opportunities. You don't see them every day, but you do see them. You know, we have designed a number of filters over the year to kind of look for these things and where can you find them and look for some of these different relationships. And when we find them, we always go investigate very carefully to make sure, again, almost with a mindset of, I got to find a reason not to do this trade. So if there's an option that I can own for some reasonable period of time in a market that has some continuity to it, there's not some reason to expect that the price six months from now and, and a year and a half from now are literally two different things and they're totally unrelated. Like, there's always, you know, a market like gas has big seasonal swings and the fundamentals can certainly shift over any kind of six or 12 month period. But the whole curve still does move together a lot and there's still a lot of correlation embedded in some of these things. And so finding those opportunities, we try very, very hard to find those things when we can own convexity and not, not only not pay a lot, but sometimes get paid a little bit to carry it. I want to focus a bit on this phrase, fundamental analysis. I don't think I've recorded enough episodes to have a cliche yet, but if there were a cliche, I feel like it would be a lot of my guests come on and they say, well, I read Ben Graham, I read security analysis, and then somehow I totally decided to go systematic. But my suspicion in here is that y your intention of the phrase fundamental analysis is not the same way a lot of us would think of it in the equity space. So can you expand on sort of what you mean here by fundamental analysis in the commodity space? Yeah, sure. When I say fundamental analysis, it's really supply and demand analysis of the underlying commodity market itself. And because I'm not an equity expert, I don't really know how to relate this necessarily to equity fundamental research, if you will. But I think in spirit, it's similar to what a, what a fundamental equity analyst would do. They're out trying to maybe anticipate and model cash flows and revenues and costs. And on our side, we're looking at what's consumption going to do. If I'm looking at the oil market, I want to try to understand where is consumption growing? Where is it retreating production? You know, what are the economics of well drilling right here? Who are the competitive producers? Who are the marginal producers? Who's motivated to be increasing CapEx and bring production online? What's OPEC going to be doing? You know, different commodity markets have kind of, I guess, different degrees of complexity around that. Some commodities are very geared to global GDP growth. And when you're looking at demand, for example, in the oil space, you're going to have to rely a lot on, on assumptions about what that might look like. And you can get very detailed with that analysis. You can get into country by country or sector by sector growth and kind of where oil gets used and what those expectations might look like. But at some level, from our perspective, and, and again, this is kind of where I guess to get back to your cliche, 
I view my job really as under, having enough of an understanding of the fundamentals to be able to evaluate if the options market is pricing in reasonably rational probabilities for different outcomes. I would not hold myself up as the foremost expert on fundamental oil analysis, for example. As a generalist across the commodity space, I'm really trying to stay abreast of those fundamentals enough to know, hey, is there an opportunity here? Is there an inflection point in the way that some of these trends are shifting in supply or in demand? Is there a a new technology that's come in? Shale oil is a great example. Hey, there's a fundamentally different way that we can extract oil from the ground that has different economics, different cycles, the days of spend $5 billion drilling a deep sea semi-submersible platform and spending 25 years kind of watching the oil come out of there. Shale is very different. Shale is is like a just-in-time inventory type of mindset, which is, hey, I've got an opportunity to deploy a rig right here. I can do that in two weeks. And three months later, I've got oil coming out of the ground and I can hedge that. And it's a very different process. So when you're seeing things like that impact markets, I think the challenge from a, a discretionary manager side, at least from what I'm doing, is to say, okay, where is there an opportunity and is there a shift in some of these fundamentals or an inflection point where we can really access options that give us very leveraged payout in the event that this becomes, you know, whatever this inflection point is, becomes a much bigger deal right? or things shift or what, whatever happens there. Are there markets where fundamental analysis is either easier or just has a more natural path? Like I would have to imagine fundamental analysis on something like gold is intrinsically different than natural gas, right? Yeah, totally. No, you're exactly right. And actually you hit on probably two that I would use as examples. I think gold is a great one because understanding the supply side or production costs of the gold market, I don't think is going to get you very far towards being able to ascertain what might be happening to the gold price over any reasonable time horizon. Gold is just not, it's not priced that way. It's not consumed in the sense of most other commodities. Every ounce of gold that's ever been mined is theory still above the ground unless someone buried it again in a treasure chest or something. And so the dynamics that drive that market are very, very different. It's a macro driven market. People are using it for all kinds of different purposes. And yes, so from that vantage point, I think there's very little that a fundamental analysis of the supply side, or there is no end use demand really other than jewelry. It's really about monetary demand and investor demand. That's a macro framework that you're going to have to use to really analyze that. And then the other kind of side of the continuum, I suppose if I went all the way, I could go to power or electricity markets where you have no opportunity to store it at all. And so you have very, very real time almost pricing where the only thing that matters is your very immediate kind of supply and demand. You know, what's your weather, what's your industrial load, what those types of things. So and gas is pretty far down that continuum as well. So I think gas, natural gas, it's not immune to the macro space. It's obviously going to care. That market cares a lot about what industrial gas use is going to be. And that's driven by a lot of economic processes. So factories and manufacturing processes, as well as refining processes, they all utilize gas, but it has a lot of other factors to it that you know you can analyze. You've got a very rich data world in gas. You have almost real-time information coming at you from pipeline scrapes and storage inventories and LNG loadings and industrial demand samples and all this stuff. So You can, depending on the amount of money you want to spend, get almost as much data as you could possibly want about kind of what's happening in the market right here and right now. There's different flavors. I mean, that that lends itself very, very well to modeling. Weather's a big impact in gas demand and, and therefore pricing. So you can kind of model different weather scenarios with what you think you're getting from the data side and and all that sort of stuff. And again, that looks very different, obviously, than gold or maybe a market like copper where you're you can store copper for a really long time. It's going to have a very macro component to it. But unlike gold, your cost of production does matter. Your demand does matter. These things are all going to have an impact. So, Going back to this, the fundamental view, I would imagine that just like the equity market, it's not enough to have a fundamental view. You need to have a fundamental view that sort of is mispriced in the market. How do you measure that mispricing? I can imagine with the commodity itself, you could just say, I think the price is wrong. But when you're trading a derivative of that, how are you thinking about measuring the mispricing 
in the derivative? I mean, that's a fantastic question, Corey. I think at the highest or maybe just the most basic level, I think this is where human judgment comes in and where I think experience plays a really large part in kind of how you look at that. You know, and I'm certainly relying on some element of pattern recognition in kind of looking at things that may or may not catalyze a move in a certain market and trying to estimate how impactful that might be and importantly kind of over what time horizon. I think I touched on earlier that trying to have a diversified portfolio of convexity exposures, I sometimes think of myself as a value-based convexity investor, essentially. I want a margin of safety to maybe come back to your Ben Graham analogy, priced into my derivative. I try not to put too high an emphasis on my own ability to forecast what a market may or may not do. I think we can develop confidence in our understanding of the fundamentals, but fundamentals can always change. And just because I think something's going to happen, I can be wrong. And where I think you have the art that meets the science in this is really saying, all right, how much of a margin of safety in a certain derivative payout do I think is appropriate? And if I find an option that has a two to one payout that will pay me two to one if whatever I think is going to happen happens, that's not that attractive to me, honestly. I'd like to think I'm right more than half the time, but I, I wouldn't necessarily bet on it. I prefer something that has a five to one payout or a six to one payout or something where I can really get some amount of leverage, either in a terminal payout or a path along the way that says, hey, if people's viewpoints change on this, or if we kind of get to maturity and in fact, we're right about the way the fundamentals have evolved, I'm going to get paid a lot on this because a lot of things can go wrong along the way. And so I think it's just a matter of using my own judgment and saying how much of a probability disconnect do I need to see between where the market's priced and where I think this thing should be priced to action it and then to action it, you know, in what kind of size. So the larger the disconnect for me, then typically by default, the larger the size it would end up in my portfolio. You mentioned them very briefly, but I know in a prior conversation we had, you mentioned that sort of relationship options and spreads are bread and butter trades for you and make really interesting trades for you. As someone who doesn't actively trade this market, can you walk me through first, what are these spread trades and why are they so interesting? I find them to be, I don't want to say they're unique, but I think they're definitely different animals than what I've seen in other asset classes. First and foremost, just at a very basic level, they are options that give you the ability to buy or sell something with a strike price that's determined based on a differential between two or sometimes more underlying assets. So you can trade calendar spread options in a number of different markets. That gives you an option that's based on a differential between prices on two different settlement dates. It'll expire at the earliest of those two settle dates. You can trade in the petroleum complex, you can trade crack options. A crack is a relationship between a refined product and the underlying crude. So gasoline and heating oil and gas oil all have kind of unique differential options between, you can trade that uh, will reflect the price between those things in crude oil. You can even trade refinery margin options, which give you a basket of different refined products against crude oil. So particularly in the energy space, these things proliferate. There's also in the agricultural space, calendar spread options and soybean oil versus meal and soybean crack. And so a lot of these different relational types of options. I like them for a few reasons. We touched on one already, which is I think for whatever reason, there tend to be a lot of participants in these markets on the end user, you know, or producer or, or merchant side, if you will, that are looking at it through a different lens. I'm looking at these through a lens of being able to access cheap convexity or maybe cheap correlation, which is typically one of the assumptions that underlies the price of these things, they may just not care about that that much. And they've got different reasons for acting in those markets than I might. And so there's always opportunities that can crop up from that. We've also touched a little bit on, I find opportunities the most interesting typically when there's a confluence of different factors that are all kind of working together. Almost by definition with these options, you have a confluence of factors. You have at least two different prices at least two different volatilities, a correlation, and then you can start talking about skew in terms of out of the moneyness and these things. And, and that's a lot of things that can come into making a certain spread option cheap for a reason that, again, if you broke it down component by component, you might look at something and say, hey, none of these things really look 
irrational in and of themselves. It's only when you kind of pile them all on top of each other that you get a derivative price that just ends up being really, really cheap for whatever reason. I've also found that in the relational space, if you will, so if I take time spreads or forward curve structure as an example, the market tends to behave in a regime for periods of time. So the oil market, for example, will tend to go through periods of time where we're in contango, where we're upward sloping. Future prices are more expensive than spot prices. And then for whatever reason, as inventories draw down or maybe the production changes a little bit or something changes, the, the curve will flip. But it usually kind of these regimes will last sometimes longer than they should. And then when they flip, they tend to flip really aggressively and quickly into that new regime. And then likewise, kind of get really sticky again there for a while. And it's I don't have a great underlying fundamental rationale for why that takes place. I've got a few theories, but regardless, I've just found over the years that that tends to be the way things behave. And in general, I find these options, they're priced over time. I think they're priced rationally, but if you believe that you might be near one of those inflection points, many times I think they're priced very, very cheaply to allow you to access that. And if you don't get it exactly right, you don't pay very much for kind of having a go at it. So anyway, I think that's the, just all those factors together, I think make them really, really interesting. And I suppose, honestly, the other reason is there's just less people that look at them. I think you need to be somewhat of a commodity specialist to be able to kind of understand what you're dealing with with these things. And then you kind of have to understand options well enough to kind of unpack convexities and volatility relationships and that sort of stuff and correlations to kind of figure out what you're buying. And I think there's less people doing that. So less people doing that is generally good for me. Can I get you to expand it all on those dynamics you're talking about, the sort of stickiness of contango or backwardation and, and your theories for it? I guess in my head, I sort of visualize fundamentals sometimes as underlying sequences. You know, imagine kind of sine waves operating with different curiosity and, and maybe different frequencies and things, inventories, global inventory balances, and kind of the current deficit or surplus that a market might be running tends to govern what those forward curve structures are going to look like. And a lot of times inventories operate with a significant lag to underlying changes in supply and demand fundamentals. So if we can, through our fundamental analysis, identify what we think might be an inflection point where you're going to see a shift in certain factors that are going to drive that market balance, it might take time for that to play out in terms of moving inventory levels to places where the curve needs to shift to incentivize people to do different things. So oil recently, we've seen a regime where we moved very quickly from what had been a fairly persistent backwardation into coming into the COVID epidemic here. We obviously, oil prices cratered and we move very quickly into an enormous contango. The other, and I didn't really touch on this before, but the other really interesting thing about spread options, different markets have different capacities to hold inventories. So aluminum, maybe I'll use as an example of a market that really you can stack aluminum outside your back door. And if you want to throw a tarp over it, that's nice. But like you can literally store as much as you want almost forever and nothing's going to happen to it as long as no one steals it. Oil, maybe go to the other end of the continuum. Power, as I touched on before, no storage. We all wish there was, and maybe we need to figure that out. But right now there's not really any practical storage for electricity. That market it has a forward curve, but it's almost kind of meaningless. You're just trading the real time kind of here and now. Most markets fall somewhere in between. If you look at oil, I think is a really good example. You have a large amount of global storage capacity, but certainly finite. And we found out just this past year what the market looks like when you're going to potentially breach that storage capacity. And the market has to very, very quickly incentivize people to turn off production. Obviously, we got incredibly volatile, incredibly unprecedented, I guess, price moves. We traded negative minus $37 and all this other stuff in oil that everyone's kind of heard about. Generally, things are not that extreme. However, different markets and different delivery points are all functioning with different constraints. And there are times when the market sort of gets to the limits of what is possible to store or runs out. 
and maybe we're not going to run out globally, but there have been times where Cushing balances when the delivery point in Oklahoma get really, really low and, and backwardations can get really, really extreme. And the flip side is true. So not only you have these regime shifts, but then sometimes you have these incredibly volatile moves when you trade through or forcing people to kind of not breach your capacity or not draw down inventories to the point where you run empty. And so that's that's another kind of manifestation, if you will, of that it, being able to access some cheap convexity gives you almost that extra kicker sometimes that, hey, not only are you shifting regime, but like, oh my gosh, really quickly here, we're going to have a situation where we need to incentivize people to not send us any more oil. And in order to do that, we've got to have an exceptionally extreme move in the curve to make that happen. Has the reality of seeing something like oil go negative change anything fundamental about how you think about convexity in those markets? I mean, beyond just you got to change your options pricing <laughs> formula all of a sudden, does it change anything fundamental for you? We've seen the negative price before in different commodities. So in natural gas in particular, we've had experience with this before. Again, I think for people who had been in the commodity markets for a long time, looking at what was unfolding in the oil market, I don't think too many of us, and I will not put myself, I did not think we would see minus $37 a barrel. That was not on my radar screen. But the potential for a negative price was, and I think that that's just how extreme our fundamental situation got so quickly that the market just couldn't, was not going to be able to adapt and adjust quickly enough to it. I think that that's exceptionally unusual, and I do not expect to see that on a regular basis. There are markets like natural gas where it can happen much more regularly. And just given our kind of fundamental landscape right now, it's not inconceivable that that could happen again. Certainly, certain basis points are routinely in a negative price situation in natural gas. I don't know if it changes my wholesale view on convexity. The extreme outcome of that for me is very directly related to the rise of some of the investment products that we talked about earlier. So ETFs and factor modeling and some of those things. Some folks who are trading in those types of securities, I don't think had had a lot of experience in commodities or maybe it wasn't their primary expertise, didn't understand what can happen. And so I think everybody got a lesson in what can happen and you got it with a really high profile market like crude oil. It does make me realize that those same types of factors and same types of financial products are in other commodity markets too. And so I need to maybe open the horizon of what might be possible in certain markets when we have extreme fundamental situations that are developing. As I listen to you talk, my head really starts to swim just with what seems like just such a massive opportunity set, sort of the degrees of freedom you have, not only in the different markets you can trade, but when you're talking about the options, the different expirations, the strikes, you've got the relationship spreads. It seems to me like just such a complex universe to even begin thinking about constructing a portfolio. And so I guess that is my question. I mean, how in the world do you even begin constructing a portfolio? And then more selfishly from my perspective, because I always love thinking about risk. How do you think about managing risk in a portfolio like that? Right. Okay. Um, two questions, both of them really large. We can start with the first one and I'll, re I'll ask the second one again. And I'll answer the first one first. That is, it's a huge challenge. Maybe it's my biggest challenge is kind of given all these different markets, how do I think about what makes the best positions to go in my portfolio at any given time? You know, I think having this wide and diverse of a set of different markets, it's a blessing and a curse. I guess the blessing side of it is, again, coming back, there's a whole bunch of uncorrelated markets to look at. That's great. The curse is like, there's a whole bunch of markets I have to look at. And so really my job is to stay on top of the fundamentals of those markets enough to know when we should be spending more time in a particular market. So just kind of, I don't want to say this being a little flippant, but knowing enough to be dangerous kind of in any market and hopefully knowing enough then when to dive deeper and say, Hey, I think there's really a deeper opportunity on the fundamental side here. We really should look at this. And the other part, you know, and I, as I kind of think about where positioning comes from, for me, some of it is fundamentally driven bottoms up analysis, supply and demand fundamentals, just as many positions, if not more, are more top down looking at the markets, looking at different derivatives and options pricing throughout the markets that we're looking at and trying to 
in a somewhat regimented way say, hey, does this look reasonable? Do these option prices make sense? We have a whole series of simple but useful filters that we use to help us with that. There's just too many, obviously too many derivative prices to look at every single day in every single market, but you can kind of filter down different opportunities. And you touched on one earlier, which is kind of, uh, can I own, can I be long optionality or long convexity and have a positive decay expectation? So we scrape a lot of data and securities prices to kind of look for those types of opportunities. And when we find them, then it's about saying, okay, hey, let's dig into this. Why is this? What confluence of factors is causing this to happen? And does that kind of line up with our expectation of fundamentals or not? Is there an opportunity there for us? I think you didn't say this specifically, but in addition to just kind of looking across the different markets and finding some of these opportunities, the challenge then comes in how to size them in your portfolio. And again, I think there's an art to that. And I'm relying a lot on my own experience to kind of determine that Factors that go into that are how much leverage and what kind of potential payout do I think is reasonable on a given trade. And that usually stems from kind of our assessment of probability of payout and probability of a move based on what we are seeing in the market and what we can access. I think the other aspects of those things, I guess we haven't talked about, maybe I'll, I'll jump ahead here and talk about risk a little bit because these things start to tie together. My fundamental risk management rule is to live within a drawdown from peak framework. So my background, I spent a number of years at Caxton and More Capital. These are both firms that developed out of a, a firm called Commodity Corp kind of in the late 80s and early 90s. Commodity Corp, their portfolio managers all had to live with this drawdown from peak rule. I'm not sure if it actually predates VAR and a lot of the other uh, traditional risk measures that we look at today, but this was the way that they controlled risk in their portfolio managers. And I found it to be a really elegant risk rule. Now, obviously, it's not the only thing we look at. We do look at VAR across our portfolio and scenario analytics and correlations and kind of all the traditional risk manager types of things you would look at. But living within a drawdown from peak framework particularly being an options trader requires a certain type of discipline. So when I'm thinking about my portfolio and sizing things, I'm sizing them basically based on how much can I lose on a particular trade and how big a part of my overall drawdown budget does that represent? How much do I want to concentrate my portfolio in certain positions? If I am wrong on a trade and I lose substantially everything that I think I'm risking on it, where is that going to put me in my drawdown? Historically, I've found, and I think you know, mathematically you can understand, let's say you have a drawdown from peak that's 20% and you draw down 10%, it becomes very challenging as a portfolio manager to try to make that back. Essentially, you have kind of halved your capital at that point and you need to have a much larger gain to offset that loss that you've experienced. And so I'm very careful in terms of how much of my drawdown budget I'm utilizing in any given moment and, and how much I might you know, lose if everything went against me all at the same time. So that's really, in terms of portfolio construction and sizing trades, I'm approaching it from that lens of drawdown budgeting and concentration based on that combined with, hey, what's my payoff on these things if I'm right? How much leverage am I able to access in the market and what probability do I think there is that I can realize that. So speaking of the risk management side, totally take it to a unprofessional question maybe, but my very naive perception of this space is that everyone always blows up trading natural gas. <laughs> As a commodity guy, why does natural gas seem like it's the widow maker? <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a number of reasons why. I think though, maybe the predominant reason for that is because I think there are a number of trades or opportunities that manifest themselves in natural gas that offer outsized returns with a low probability of blow up risk. But when things blow up in gas, they usually blow up really big. And I can think of a couple examples. I mean, the one that everybody in the news media is fascinated with is always the March-April spread. March-April is kind of a shorthand way of saying your seasonal spread between winter and the following summer. So in gas, you have a market where you're seasonally injecting gas into storage every summer because we use more than we produce in the winter. So we need inventories to build. 
to give us a big enough cushion that it will see us through the winter so we don't run out of gas. March is traditionally the last month of the winter season. So it's that March, April spread is always kind of your, your risk of running out of gas before the winter's over. And the market will routinely price that at a fairly hefty premium before you come into the winter because it's very weather dependent. There's a lot of unknowns. You just don't know what this is going to look like. But almost always that spread is going to go out in contango. So it'll usually be priced at a pretty big backwardation heading into the winter. And with reasonable certainty, you kind of know it's going to be a contango by the time you, you settle. But the path can be incredibly volatile. And every once in a while, we have a really cold winter or we have a confluence of events where we have a real risk of running out and, th and that spread can explode. So it's kind of the proverbial picking up pennies in front of the steamroller. Like most of the time you're going to do fine on that. Every once in a while, you're going to lose a whole lot and you've, you've got to, I don't think people are always thinking through all the ramifications of what happened that this is the time that it blows up when I happen to be doing this trade. So. So I do want to go back to your peak to trough drawdown and, and budgeting. I know I put us on a tangent there, but it is a really fascinating way of thinking about risk. I can imagine that you could take an extremely draconian approach and just assume that correlations everywhere are one, right? You can price every trade as if all the correlations are going to one. And even though there is a huge amount of breadth in this universe, I have to imagine there are market environments where that can converge to one that you have forced liquidation market participants who have to delever or margin requirements go up and everyone has to delever to come up with capital. So there, there is that risk of going to one, but I would imagine that puts you massively under risk for the other nine out of 10 years that you're living through. So you're, you're sort of, I imagine, threading a needle here. How do you think about finding that right balance of thinking about sort of the risk of correlation spiking versus being able to create sufficient returns uh, during normal market environments? Yeah, good question again. I think for me, it's there's a whole number of different factors that I'll look at. One of the biggest ones is, is market positioning. And I think you kind of touched on you know, those environments where correlations kind of get driven to one across the board. And really for me, what that means is you just have a common investor universe and whatever trades they're in are going to witness them getting out of. And we do a lot of work. I don't want to say more than our fundamental analysis, but maybe as much as we do on the fundamental side to understand the landscape of market positioning from all of the various actors in the marketplace. So other people like me, discretionary, commodity focused, portfolio managers, factor systems, CTA, momentum, producer, consumer. We really try to go through and model that as best we can while recognizing we're not going to be perfect. We think that it gives us a pretty good understanding of where certainly where there are large concentrations of risk, large concentrations of people positions. So in terms of then looking at a portfolio that might have a number of different trades on it and thinking about, okay, what do we have to be fearful of here in terms of correlations going to one, we try to utilize that lens of positioning to draw as many reasonable assumptions as we can you know, around that and say, okay, let's look at our portfolio. Let's look at where we know positioning is. Do we have a whole bunch of trades that line up with positioning in a way that we better expect in a correlation one environment, this is going to be really painful for us. Or in fact, are half of our positions, for example, kind of anti what people we think people are positioned right now. Okay, then we can probably operate on a lot less draconian assumptions around what that correlation might do if we move into a highly risk averse environment. So that's in terms of sizing individual trades, it does, it's a little bit of a recursive process in terms of what else is in the portfolio. Do we think we can size things larger because we have other trades in the portfolio that are very anti-consensus and in a liquidation event we think would perform a certain way? Or at least we never like to be dependent on a trade performing to provide a hedge for us. Rather, I just wanted to make sure that you don't have two trades that are necessarily both going to go to zero at the same time for the same reason. Maybe different reasons, but, but not for the same reason. Again, I don't want to... There's an art to this as well, but a lot of our framework around thinking about portfolio risk and how much of our overall drawdown budget do we want to have at risk in the market at a given time, it comes down to 
this kind of understanding of positioning and correlations. And then frankly, also our own confidence. I mean, to use the most recent example, we were fortunate to kind of see what was unfolding in the oil market and we positioned ourselves accordingly. We had very, very high confidence that we would see a certain outcome of that. And we felt that the, you know, the options that we were able to access were providing us with a margin of safety that allowed us to not be too stressed about the day to day and just say, Hey, this, this, the fundamentals are dictating. We are absolutely going to have to get to shut in economics in North America. It has to happen. Otherwise we're going to be overflowing in crude oil. Here's our options. Here's our structures. This is what we paid for them. They might be worthless, but we know how much we're risking and we're very confident that this is going to happen. We can put on more risk here that, than we might otherwise feel comfortable with. So let's flip it and talk about happier things, which is let's assume a position goes right. Trading options, one of the interesting things is when you're pursuing this convexity, when your trade is correct, you actually get less convex as you go, say, from super out of the money to super in the money. You go from almost no delta to high delta, and then you become a basically a delta one instrument when you're super in the money and you lose all your convexity. So how do you think about repositioning and rebalancing your portfolio to maintain that convexity, but still be able to benefit from your correct fundamental view. Yeah. In your uh, career, you're hitting on all these. I find myself wanting to say an answer to all your questions. Yeah, this is one of my biggest challenges. This is one of my biggest challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, I think, is a unique challenge for me living in a, a drawdown from peak world. So just to kind of come back to that risk governing rule, if you will. Yeah, as... What I need to be careful of is options that are low delta or highly leveraged suddenly turning into options that are much higher delta and then going back, reverting back to being a low delta option again, because in a drawdown from peak, that's still a drawdown. And that can be somewhat debilitating to the amount of risk that I can take in my portfolio then. So I tend to be fairly aggressive in restructuring options as they move into the money. Sometimes I'm fortunate and things move very, very quickly and I can realize a very high percentage of what I think the leverage payout is on an option. But part of the reason I operate with such a margin of safety in terms of the types of risk reward that I'm looking at is I know that if markets evolve in a slower fashion and over time, my five to one payout becomes two to one, I'm probably going to restructure that payout into something that looks different. Either the market is playing out and I'm taking risk off, so I'm de-risking the trade, or I'm restructuring into something that kind of reconvexifies my portfolio in some way. And that's hard and it, it requires a lot of discipline. I mean, emotionally, that's one of the harder things I think for me to deal with is just having that kind of trying to have an unemotional discipline about doing that. And sometimes that cuts down on some of the payouts. Definitely. And there's times where I wish I just would have let it all ride to, to expiry. But over time, I think it's a necessity that you have to do that in order to avoid those kind of debilitating drawdowns when they occur. Last question of the podcast for you. In these somewhat trying times, I'm trying to get people to be hopeful looking forward. So the last question is, what are you most excited about looking forward? So these are trying times and I'd like, I'm obviously don't want to be kind of, I don't know, seem to be kind of dancing on graves and that kind of thing. For us, this is a very robust market environment. There's a lot of opportunities. And if anything, I would say the more challenging times were kind of the years running up to this in a certain way. There's a lot going on in the world and there's a lot of stuff that's unprecedented going on in the world. And I think for me, from a market framework and where can our strategy find opportunities, that's the most interesting thing. I mean, I think human beings, uh, although we're becoming a little bit of a rare breed in the markets, when you have things that genuinely have never happened before and imply all kinds of kind of knock on ramifications and things, that's where human judgment comes in. And you can begin to try to understand what are some high confidence events that are going to have to occur based on what's going on. So I find it exciting from a market landscape point of view for us. I think the other kind of backdrop in the commodity world is you are seeing the impact now of some of the technological changes that have been kind of boiling in the background. So we touched a little bit on shale oil technology, shale production, kind of revolutionizing how the oil market, not only the price of 
crude oil, but just the way the market cycles work and the way the investment cycles and things work, it's a much faster twitch kind of market now. But other things like battery electric vehicle technology, you know, obviously has big, big impacts, not only on energy utilization, but also metals supply chains. So some of the big battery metals like nickel and cobalt and things have, that's a really meaningful change to those markets. And those are still very, or longer lead time, higher CapEx types of marketplaces. So we'll see, you know, can we see that supply need be met over time in a timely enough fashion or not? You know, and just kind of looking at a lot of those technological changes across different markets and adding to the landscape of things that haven't happened before that we can kind of look at and evaluate, hopefully through our lens of how do we get access to that in in a highly leveraged way. Well, Jeff, I can't thank you enough for joining me. I know I learned a ton and it was a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much, Corey. I appreciate you having me.